Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash howshemoms. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Tara Hutchings grew up in a home without books. I don't remember seeing many books. If there was any, it was kind of maybe like a few that were used for decorating, maybe like to make a lamp a little bit taller. (laughs) And um, I'm sure there was probably a few, and I just didn't notice them just because I never saw anybody reading either. When she was young, Tara didn't realize reading was a thing in other families. She remembers visiting the library once, as if it were a trip to a museum. It was amazing to see so many books in one place, but libraries were not part of her life. Then, as a teenager, she started babysitting. I just would have, you know, the people say, like, make sure at bedtime you read two books to them each. And, like, the little two-year-old would be staring at her collection of books in her own bedroom, and she was so aware of which one she was choosing. She knew them. She had a relationship with them. She was actually trying to identify, like, what do I feel like hearing right now? Because she'd heard them so much. They were so familiar to her. Or like her older brother, who was maybe five or six. For just a little kid, he had Harry Potter, which to me, even at my older age, you know, I was a teenager and he was six. That was huge and impossible. I I just thought, well, that's so weird. Why would they be reading this big, huge book to them when he's so young? So anyways, I think just by babysitting and seeing the way other families did, did things differently, I was able to get a glimpse into whole, like different worlds and the way the other people were living. And I loved it so much. I wanted that to be a part of my life. How incredible is that, that he has a dad or a parent or someone sitting next to him, just snuggling and hearing their voice and connecting that way. That brings such a special experience, whether you're taking in the full understanding of the story or not. It makes reading such a joy. And um, I knew that that I wanted my kids to have that, you know, one day in my future. So from seeing other families, I started to realize, like, if I want things to be different, then I just am going to have to observe other ways. I think I just became the world's greatest copier. This is the How She Moms podcast, where we talk about how different moms solve the same problems. I'm Whitney Archibald, a mother of five kids myself. I collect ideas so you can pick and choose what works for you and your family. As you may have guessed, Tara's story gets way better. After struggling through school with very poor reading skills, she managed to be the first member of her family to graduate from college and she now loves to read. And so do her two boys, who practically live at the library. My older kid, who's 11, he swallows up books. He doesn't, he doesn't snack on them. When he finds one that he loves, it's like he's a paper shredder, and he just devours it. There's been times I've had to be like, I have to ground you from your book tomorrow, because <laughs> he'll stay up all night. Isn't Tara just so amazing? The whole interview just blew me away which is why I've decided to change things up a little bit here on How She Moms. I'll still start each month with a crowdsource episode with interview excerpts and ideas from lots of different moms, but I'm going to start doing weekly episodes instead of just twice a month so I can share more of the interviews I've been recording. In this episode, How She Reads, we'll talk about how moms read to their kids, how they create a culture of reading in their homes, and how they fit in some reading time for themselves. There's plenty of evidence that reading is good for our brains, and for our kids' brains. We know that reading to our kids improves their own reading skills and helps them with other academic subjects, too. The importance and value of this cannot be overstated. But all this research, all the quotas of the number of books we're supposed to read to our kids by the time they start kindergarten, is not the only reason we should read to our kids. It misses all the magic. Reading is also about connecting with other people, the people who wrote the books, the characters inside them, real or imaginary, and whoever you read the book with or talk about it with. In his book on writing, which is incredible, by the way, Stephen King talks about how reading and writing books is legitimately a form of telepathy. The writer is actually putting his or her words into another person's thoughts, 
enabling them to conjure up sophisticated images and ideas, kind of like I'm doing right now with this podcast. I just blew your mind, didn't I? This is a powerful idea. It's amazing to be able to share ideas like this. Part of the power comes from sheer vulnerability. It takes courage to put a book out there in the world. Or a podcast, for that matter. This is why I cry at book signings. Whether the table is swarmed with people or just a lonely stack of books and an expectant author, witnessing the vulnerability of an author sitting at that table and putting this piece of her soul out there for the world to judge gets me every time. Sometimes I even get a bit teary when I walk into a library. I can just feel all the love that went into each little book. A library is a holy place. Each book represents a real living, breathing, or formerly breathing person. And just think about how many hours of work went into each one. Each library holds centuries of time. It's magical. This deep connection and vulnerability is why I consider some authors to be among my best friends. Edith Wharton knows all the best gossip. Terry Pratchett makes me laugh out loud. E.B. White finds meaning in even the most mundane things. His book of essays is one of my favorite books of all time. And don't even get me started about Jane Austen, Wallace Stegner, Zora Neale Hurston, or my new friend, Wendell Berry. I often imagine inviting these wonderful friends to dinner, along with other authors, living and dead, who make up my personal canon of literary masters. We wouldn't waste time with small talk. We'd just jump into good conversation like old friends. When I had kids, I couldn't wait to introduce them to my author friends, from Dr. Seuss to Lillian Hoban to Lucy Maud Montgomery and C.S. Lewis. And reading to my kids is one of my favorite parts of being a mom. But it's also a lot harder than I thought it would be. Many moms I talked to started reading aloud to their kids while they were still in the womb, and then continued with the baby in their arms and then on their laps, and far beyond the point that they could even fit on their laps. I love imagining beautiful scenes of rapt children listening to their mother's stories in front of a cozy fireplace in houses all around the world. But the reality is often quite different. Wiggly kids jumping up and running around after every page, older kids rolling their eyes and claiming they're too old for this, whiny kids demanding that mind-numbing superhero book yet again, or you might be the problem, rushing through a book so your kids will go to sleep, hoping they don't notice when you skip pages. Spoiler alert, they always notice. Luckily, there are a lot of brilliant moms out there who, like Tara, have put some serious work into creating a culture of reading in their families and have some great ideas for us. I've organized them into 10 tips. The first is to make reading aloud a top priority. One of the biggest cheerleaders for reading to our kids is Sarah McKenzie, host of the podcast Read Aloud Revival and author of The Read Aloud Family. I first listened to her podcast as I was driving home from the airport this summer. I listened to her interview another amazing woman, Megan Cox Gurdon, author of a great book about reading aloud with kids called The Enchanted Hour. I was enchanted myself from beginning to end. When Megan said, A picture book is a portal to the human heart. I audibly gasped shut off the podcast to catch my breath, and, you knew it was coming, shed a tear or two. Anyway, here's an excerpt from that very episode, number 130 of the Read Aloud Revival, which will probably always be my favorite episode. Here Sarah is talking to Megan about making time to read aloud with your kids. I love how in your book you don't minimize the amount of effort it takes to read to our kids, especially as they grow. I mean, it really is countercultural, I think, to take a half an hour, even 20 minutes and read with our kids, especially when they're old enough to read to themselves. I know in your book, you say making the time to read together is almost an obstinate act of love. And I just love that because I really think, yes, reading aloud is it's an act of love. Oh, oh, for sure it is. And it is a sacrifice of time. And it's, you know, it can be difficult. I mean, I I write about this in the introduction, of course, referring back to the earlier days, but, you know, when my children were young, and you're, you're of course, still in those trenches, you know, getting Mm -hmm. to the read aloud at night sometimes felt like almost an insurmountable task, like how it's, it's, it's madness, and it's dinner, and it's bath time, and it's everything. And then you just, but I, you know, we, I made it absolutely something that was never to be missed. I mean, it was the one thing, it was like flossing your teeth, like it was the thing we absolutely always did, even if it was really late, or even if we could only do it for a little while. And invariably, I mean, without exception, you'd kind of fight your way through the kind of furious waves of the day. And then, oh, when you got to the read aloud, it was actually, that was, that's when I would think, 
wait, this is what I should have been doing all day long. This is the stuff. This is the way to live. This is the reward. You know, and it was, I mean, I liken it to a, to a life raft. It was, you know, the, the turbulent waters of, you know, childhood, you could, you could pull up out of that turbulence and just rest together in this place of mutual encounter. It is, it is a sacrifice. It is a, you know, it, it is a discipline. But you know what, what, what worthwhile thing does not require some effort, you know? That's right. Oh, isn't that just so good? After an argument like that, I'm guessing you're on board with the idea of reading to your kids. But implementation is where it gets a little bit tricky. That's why the second tip is to figure out the best time to read to your kids. Bedtime is the traditional time to read to kids, but Nicole, who blogs at learningaswego.blog, used to dread reading to her kids at bedtime because she was so tired. She would either agree and hurry through the book or just tell them, oh, not tonight. Then she'd feel guilty and sad that she wasn't reading to them. The thing is, Nicole actually loves reading to her kids. She just had to find a better time. So she started a new afternoon tradition called Tea and Read. They make a pot of tea and have small snacks as they read. Now it's a time they all look forward to, plus they have time to linger over the books and really enjoy them. Tara, who we heard from in the intro, finds it pretty easy to read to her kids before bed during the school year when bedtime is predictable. But they stay up later in the summer and they don't have time to squeeze it in. So in the summer, she started reading to her kids when she snuggles in and wakes them up in the morning. That worked great for them. When I just had small kids with no evening extracurriculars, we had relatively early bedtimes and reading was a regular part of our bedtime routine. I was really good and consistent about reading aloud. And we all loved it. I thought it would always be that way. Jump to now with kids that range from 3 to 13. What with homework, sports, and other activities, bedtime is anything but routine. It changes every night. I need quick routines, and I don't have time to linger over a book. So last year, I decided the best time to read to my preschooler is right after I drop the other kids off at school. When I read to him in the morning, I'm not exhausted, and I'm not rushing against the clock. We can take time to look at the pictures, ask questions, laugh at King Bidgood in that bathtub, and talk about the story. The magic is back. Then I still usually read to my daughter at night after I put my youngest son in bed. Unfortunately, though, I had kind of stopped reading to the three older boys. This week, inspired by all the research I've been doing on the topic, I decided to start a family read aloud. It's been several years since I attempted to read to them all at once. I tried reading at random times we were all together, like during snacks or meals, while they were playing Legos, or sometimes right before bed. For the first few days, it went great. But by chapter four, when reading time erupted into multiple fights, and everyone but my daughter said they don't even care about the book, I decided that this might not be our season for an entire family read aloud. Too many different ages, different interests, different schedules, and some volatile personalities. But I'm not giving up, just switching tactics. I've picked individual read-alouds for each kid, and I'll try to fit in a few minutes at a time when I can. This will solve another problem I'm having, making time for one-on-one time. It's all about experimenting until we figure out what works, and it's important enough to keep trying, even when it's hard. The third tip is to delight in reading. Angela Halliday remembers how excited her Aunt Anne was when she learned how to read. She would just, Angie, she called me Angie, not very many people call me Angie. (laughs) Um, You can read, let's read this book, let's read this book. And she would just get so excited for any little thing that I could do. And I I must have been probably four um, when I could, you know, put start putting a little sentence together or recognize words. And I just remember her being my biggest cheerleader, you know, Um, she wanted to take a picture of me reading. She wanted to, you know clap and you know tell everybody that her little Angie can read anyway I just I just love that she got so excited that I could read yeah and um, so it was a big deal to her so then it became a big deal to me this excitement for reading stuck with Angela for the rest of her life she shared this passion with her own five children and this summer she was also able to share her love for reading with the people of a small village in Malawi called Katsukalawa she joined a group from the nonprofit organization Village Book Builders to help finish a library in the village and stock it with 1,500 books, computers, solar panels, and other amenities. Here's Angela again. 
while I was there, uh, we split up in groups and were able to go visit each home, actually. Really? Yes. And we took a book with us. We'd read books to the families with the parents, the kids, everybody would gather and around. And do they speak English they, pretty well? Some of them speak English okay. We had a translator with us to help us with anything we needed help with. But the awe in their eyes that we had books in our hands that they could look at you know, a touch and feel book. We had them touch the books. They were in awe of being able to hold books. It was incredible to me when we have so many books around us here, we take it for granted. They had no idea. One specific story, the 76 year old woman, all six of her children have died of AIDS actually. And she had never had a book in her home. We sat there with her granddaughter and great grandson who was a baby and we read the little engine that could. You should have seen her face. She was tickled pink about the little peaches and apples and oranges and the dolls that could talk and that the little engine made it over. I, the magic of the story brought sparkles to her eyes and I had not looked at that book that way in a long time. And so the little baby and his mother, her granddaughter, were just captivated by this book, not to mention the grandma. And the idea that they can now go to this library that's in their village within walking distance and check out these books, bring them into their own homes, read with their kids. We challenge them that reading with your children or having your children read to you is a beautiful way to cultivate this reading culture in your homes, which is, you know, what we've, what we do here, a lot of us do here. And that brings hope to them for education, for better futures, for a world outside of this village that's ravaged by poverty and starvation and no electricity and sickness. It was an amazing experience. You can hear more about Angela's trip to Malawi later this month when I post her full interview here on the How She Moms podcast. And you can learn more about Village Book Builders at villagebookbuilders.org. I'll include a link in my show notes. I'm guessing that most people listening have convenient access to libraries and books. It's easy in such abundance to take them for granted. This was such a good reminder to me to help our kids really find delight and wonder in books. Sadly, some of the delight of reading fades as kids grow up. Here's Sarah McKenzie from episode 125 of Read Aloud Revival. Usually when we have kids who don't love reading, it's because a love of stories and books have been schooled out of them. I don't know too many three or four-year-olds who don't like to be told a bedtime story, <laughs> but our older kids often start to dislike reading as soon as they associate reading with the kind of reading they do for school. Whether they're homeschooled or they go to traditional school or any kind of hybrid school, a lot of times the way we engage our kids with reading around their education literally ruins reading for them. And we can't just blame the schools. Here's Sarah again. Parents who think that the primary importance of reading is success in school or academic benefits, those children will read less than parents who think that the primary source of reading is entertainment. I think especially for a lot of us who care very deeply about our children's academic life, about their reading life, about their soul formation, we have this tendency to really think that the entertainment value of reading is just gravy, but it's actually more than that. It's so important. And if we really think about the adults we know who read voraciously, they enjoy reading, right? They actually see it as entertainment. So for a lot of my friends who I know who read voraciously, they will very happily read a book instead of watching something on TV or go to a movie. To them, it's entertainment as well as all the other benefits. But I think if we remember that importance of delight, then we will have an easier time setting up a book club culture in our home because we will remember that there, our children loving reading is not just a benefit or a bonus, it's the heart of the reading life. If your child doesn't love reading, they just won't read. The fourth tip is to give books as gifts or rewards. Nothing elevates the status of an object quite like wrapping it up in shiny paper. My kids know that they'll get a hand-picked book at every birthday, Christmas, and Easter. My friend Amy Leffler also gives bookstore gift cards as gifts, so her kids get the excitement of picking out books on their own. Cindy Liggett passed down special books that her children loved to her grandchildren. They think it's so cool to read the very same copy of the book that their parents read and treasured. And Kelly Durant buys books as souvenirs when she travels with her family, even though they could buy the same books from home. This tradition started with their first family vacation with their kids to South Carolina. Here's Kelly. We were at a plantation, and we watched a woman do a presentation about the Gullah Geechee heritage and the songs and the poems and the history with that area. 
And to me, it was very meaningful. And they had a gift shop right there. And sometimes gifts are lost or toys get broken or things, but books are a lifetime. They last and they endure. And I saw a book that to me described and told a story about the experience that we had had together there as a family. And the book is called Circle Unbroken. And it's about a young girl whose grandmother tells her those stories for her own personal heritage. And that's kind of where the idea was born from. Now, whenever they travel together, they pick up a new book. We took a trip a few years ago where we started out in New Orleans. And we took a swamp tour where we went on the boat, the pontoon boat, and went through the swamp and saw alligators. And we got to feed them off the boat. And we got to hold a baby one. And we saw the other creatures. And when we finished that tour and went into the gift shop, there was a book called Petite Rouge, and which means little red in French. And being in Cajun country, the book was all about Little Red Riding Hood. The difference is it's not a big bad wolf, it's a big bad crocodile. And so as we read that book, we're able to talk about and reminisce about the swamp tour that we took. And we talk about the crocodile that we held and took pictures of and fed and And it takes us back to that part of the country because of the accent and the type of vocabulary that they use. And it really just takes us back to that where we can have a conversation and remember the fun time that we shared as a family. As a bonus, the Cajun accent Kelly uses when she reads the book to her kids is legendary in their house. But I decided not to make her do it for the podcast. Another great way to make books feel special is to use them as rewards. Letting kids earn books themselves or to earn read-aloud time for good behavior or for being consistent with chores. Sometimes when I help my kids clean their room, I'll say, once we finish cleaning up all the clothes, we get to read two pages. Then we'll pick up all the toys and earn another couple of pages. The fifth tip is to make books accessible. A motherhood mentor of mine and one of the most interesting women I know, Tamsin Barlow, furnishes her whole house with books. There are stacks on every table, shelf, and nightstand. There's no doubt how great a role books have in their family life. One of my favorite rooms in the house is the guest bathroom. It's decorated from floor to ceiling with framed quotes, chosen by all six family members from their favorite books. It's so fun to read them. Angela Halliday, who we heard from earlier, keeps bookshelves in all of her kids' rooms and makes sure to update them every now and again with fresh books as her kids' reading progresses. She wants them to always have good books at their fingertips, and they all love to read. Even though her kids are 9 and 12, Ann Trott keeps their library basket full of picture books so they can casually pick them up and browse through them. Ann says, I never want them to outgrow picture books. The beautiful illustrations, great values, and lessons that can be learned in short stories are just priceless. I like to keep a couple of books in the car so I can read to my son while we're waiting at school pickup or other activities. Sarah Haugie also keeps books in her car, but she chooses books that she wants to donate. So when she and her kids come across one of the little free libraries that are scattered around town, they can swap them out for new books. I'm going to sneak in a bonus tip here. Centered around my new podcast sponsor, Audible. Listen to books together. About three years ago, my family signed up for Audible, and road trips have never been the same. Last year, when we were listening to Lois Lowry's The Giver, we found ourselves making up excuses to drive places together so we could keep listening. We had a strict rule that no one was allowed to listen ahead. My two oldest boys also love to listen to books on Audible at bedtime. If you haven't already experienced Audible, now's a great time to start. Audible is offering listeners of the How She Moms podcast a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. Some of our favorite family Audible picks have been The Giver, which I already mentioned, The Trumpet of the Swan, read by E.B. White himself, the Ramona Quimby series, and, of course, Harry Potter. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash howshemoms. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash howshemoms for your free audiobook. The sixth tip is to start a family book club. When my oldest son started reading chapter books, we started a one-on-one book club. I told him that he could pick a book and I'd read it with him, and then we'd go out for a treat and discuss it. As more of the kids became good readers, my reading and treating schedule became a bit too much to handle. So now I rotate which kid gets to pick the book, and anyone who reads it can come. It's been such a fun way to discuss big ideas with the kids, and they feel so grown up being in a book club. 
Beau Leffler works overseas for much of the year, so he and his daughters have a long-distance book club where they read the same books and discuss them. It's a great way for them to connect over a long distance. Thirteen years ago, Maria Eckersley started a family summer tradition called the Couch Potato Book Club. Every so often, she calls a random club meeting and announces the location, a weird location around the house like the trampoline, the basement floor, in the car, in hammocks, or some other hideout. They start each meeting with a secret chant. It's classified, and they have specific rules. Only fantasy books are allowed. They can never read in the same place twice per book. No overhead lights are allowed, just flashlights and lanterns. Everyone has to be in PJs and have their teeth brushed before they start, and they use ridiculous voices for the characters. The name Couch Potato Book Club came from another rule the Eckersleys observed during the summer. If you're on the couch reading, you have immunity from the chore chart. But once you get up, you have to get to work. Maria shares more of her fun ideas at mechmom.com. Sarah McKenzie created a fabulous masterclass about creating a book club culture in your family, which she aired in two parts on the Read Aloud Revival podcast, episode 125 and 126. I highly recommend listening to the whole thing. You don't have to have actual meetings to create a book club culture. You just have to start meaningful conversations about the books you and your kids are reading. The same rules apply here as when your kids come home from school. You don't ask them yes or no questions like, did you like the book? You ask open-ended questions that make them think and engage. Books can be such a great avenue to talk about tricky moral issues, values, and relationships. Sarah's list of 10 discussion questions to ask your kids may be the best part of her book, The Read Aloud Family. A few of my favorites are, who is the most courageous character in this story? Which character reminds you most of yourself? What is the character most afraid of? And what surprised you most about the book? I suggest you hurry and find the book immediately to read the rest of her questions. The whole book is so good. The seventh tip is to create reading rituals. During the winter months when it got dark earlier, Kristen Wood would read by candlelight with her kids and have cookies and milk. Bo Leffler's family used to gather in the living room with a big bowl of popcorn and just have reading sessions. Sarah McKenzie recommends Saturday mornings over pancakes or Sunday afternoons with brownies for read-aloud sessions. Some moms pair a relevant activity with the book, especially with little kids. This doesn't have to be elaborate. When Lauren Newman introduced her kids to the book Blueberries for Sal by Robert McCloskey, she paired it with a big bowl full of blueberries. She also finds her sons are more likely to listen to a book when they have something else to do while listening, like playing Legos, folding paper airplanes, or coloring. Audra Elkington's daughters like to draw pictures of what they're listening to as she reads. When Sarah Hauge and her kids read Charlotte's Web, they also watched the movie and made a craft, a spider web in the corner of a doorway with the words kind spelled out in it. Tip number eight is to have the kids read to each other. Since her son has to read every night for school anyway, Kira Godfrey has him read to his sweet baby sister each night. Of course, this is a win-win because reading aloud is so good for the one reading and the one being read to. Plus, it's a great way for them to bond. I vividly remember reading The Phantom Tollbooth and The Trumpet of the Swan to my own younger siblings. I loved sharing my favorite books with them. Some of the sweetest moments between my kids have been when they've read together. When bedtime rolls around and I'm needed elsewhere, I often assign one of the older kids to read to my youngest to settle him down until I can make it up to tuck him in. Tip 9 is to choose great books to read with your kids. There are so many delightful books out there, but there are also lots of books that will make reading to your kids a chore. Gina Prescott has strong opinions about this, and I love strong opinions. I realized pretty quickly when Max was little that there are really bad books that exist. (laughs) I remember I had a couple of books that people had probably given me for like a baby shower or something. I don't know how I got them, but I remember you know, Max started being of an age where he would want to choose a book and I would try to read to him because I knew like, oh, reading is so important to your kid and, you know, for their brain development and everything. And I would read and it numbed my brain. And I was like, this book is so awful. But honestly, they were just character books, you know, Lightning McQueen or whatever. For some reason, they're too long and they're just so uninteresting. There's nothing happening in them. There's no humor. There's nothing that makes a book good. 
I realized I had this concept of, oh, if my child wants to read a book, I have to read them whatever book they want to read. And I was like, no, I am the captain of the ship. And I literally gathered up all the books that I could not stand anymore. And I just donated them. And I started looking and researching online people who were recommending good books. And the first blog that I came across was Everyday Reading. And she just had all these great book recommendations. And I was like, oh, this is perfect. And so I kind of just started following her. And, you know, she also had really great adult book recommendations. I would go to the library and I would just, you know, put on hold um, all those books. I would just check them out virtually. And then I'd show up at the library and grab those books. Yeah, so I started doing that. And that's kind of how I started really falling in love with reading to my kids and being really passionate about making sure that we have quality literature in in our home. You know, if kids are getting those really empty books that really have no soul to them, like no one put their heart into it, (laughs) then it's going to show. And they're they're not going to love reading because it's just going to be a bunch of words on a page. But if there's humor behind it or mystery or whatever, that's what captures us. Janae Koo likes to let her kids pick books through their school book orders because they get so excited about reading them. But she knows if left to their own devices, they could easily come home with some of those mind-numbing books that Gina was talking about. So she lets the kids make a list of the books they want from each book order, and then she picks from that list which ones to buy them. In our family, we compromise. I'm pretty flexible about reading them whatever picture book they want. I've curated our collection well enough that I like the ones we own but I always get to choose which chapter books I read aloud, or I let them pick from my three top choices. Those are a commitment that sometimes lasts several months, and I'm going to make sure I enjoy them. However, I let the kids be in charge of choosing the book club books that we read together. When choosing bedtime stories for her children as they grew up, Marjean Archibald, my mother-in-law, always went for the tearjerkers. She liked books that elicited strong emotions so her kids could learn to experience and process those feelings, both the highs and the lows, in a supportive place. Books like Where the Red Fern Grows and my personal favorite, A Hundred Dresses. Other books like A Monster Calls, in which a boy learns to cope with his mother's cancer, can really help kids deal with hard or scary things. Hannah Christmas picks books based on places she wants to visit. She can travel anywhere she wants through the pages of a book. She printed out a world map that you can color and glued it to the front of her reading journal. As she reads, she colors in the countries where each book took place. Tara loved this idea and bought a scratch-off map. She and her kids scratch off the countries they read about together. One year, I decided to do a genre project where I read highly acclaimed books in every genre I could think of, from graphic novels to mystery, westerns, sci-fi, fantasy, romance, etc. It was so fun to expand my horizons that way, and I discovered some of my very favorite books that year. There are so many great book lists to help you discover fabulous books for both you and your kids. I can't tell you which lists will be best for you since we all have different tastes. When I first look at a book list, I like to scan it for books that I've already read so I can see if I agree with the taste of the person compiling the list. Sarah Hauge has been working through Mensa's list for kindergarten through third grade with her kids. It's a fabulous one. Sarah Paulson reads through the Newbery Medal winners with her kids. Another fun list is readkiddoread.com, started by the author James Patterson, with age and genre-specific recommendations. Jansen Bradshaw at Everyday Reading, who Gina recommended, has fabulous book lists, as of course to Sarah McKenzie. My favorite podcast for adult recommendations and book talk is What Should I Read Next?, hosted by Ann Bogle. It's such a great podcast. We love so many of the same books that I really trust her recommendations. She ends each episode with a matchmaking session with her guests, picking books she thinks they'd love. The concept of book matchmaking makes me giddy. And of course, it's always wonderful when you have real live friends with similar book tastes with whom you can trade recommendations. Jillian Johnsrud, who blogs at Montana Money Adventures, has a personal rule that if three people she knows recommends the same book to her, she has to buy it. It hasn't failed her yet. Each Friday in October, I'll send out a different reading list of some of my favorite read-alouds, picture book authors, adult books, etc. You can sign up for my mailing list at HowSheMoms.com, or you can email me at Whitney at HowSheMoms.com, and I'll sign you up. The tenth tip for creating a reading culture in your home is to read books yourself and let your kids see you reading. 
The big challenge here is obviously finding the time when you're a busy mom. When she was growing up, Angela Halliday's mom instituted a great reading ritual to solve this problem. We had rest time every day, and it was in after lunch, before the afternoon activities, and we always, at least two hours, you could take a nap, or you could read a book, or you could write a story, and that's what you could do. It was quiet alone time where you'd read, and I did that with my kids as well. So all summer long, we have quiet time where we read, and um, I love that. The true genius behind this idea, and the thing that made quiet time work, is that her mom participated too. If she had used that time to get things done around the house, the kids would have been up trying to follow her around. But she would read during that time too. This is so brilliant. During the school year, Angela has her kids do quiet reading time on Sunday afternoons. I like to use reading to make mundane tasks something I actually look forward to around the house. Doing dishes or laundry are the perfect times to listen to a good audiobook, and reading a chapter in a physical book is a great reward after finishing a task. When I finish loading the dishwasher or finish sweeping the floor, I get to read a chapter. The better the book, the cleaner my house. When Brie McCoy has even five minutes of downtime, she sets a timer and picks up her current book to read it until her timer is up. Sometimes she sets it for longer if she has the time. She calls these runaway minutes, and they really add up by the end of the week. Brie talks about this and other great reading tips on the first episode of her excellent podcast, 10 Things to Tell You. Kendra Adachi has four main tactics to make time for reading. Number one, she keeps books she wants to read in plain sight, on her kitchen desk, on her nightstand, and on the table next to her favorite chair. Number two, she sets her phone restrictions to turn off at 9.15, which is her signal to pick up a book. She brings her Kindle Paperwhite everywhere she goes, and she only reads what she loves and quits the books that she doesn't. Life's too short to read books you don't love. Kendra hosts a podcast called The Lazy Genius, which is as good as its title is clever. And then there are some times you don't want the kids to see you reading and you have to be sneaky. Sherry Bates sneaks a book to family movie night because her kids and husband all like Marvel movies and she does not. Kelly does the same thing. She sits behind the kids and reads, so they think she's watching the movie with them, but she's really in her own world. I think following this last tip, letting my kids see my passion for reading, is the main reason all five of them love to read, despite the totally different personalities and their varying skill levels. It makes up for my inconsistencies and the recent volatility of our family read-alouds. As moms, our enthusiasm and passion for reading can help our kids keep that innate love for stories that they have when they're little, all the way through high school and beyond. Let's keep the magic alive. Thank you for listening to the How She Moms podcast. I'd love to find out how you mom. There are four main ways to add your voice to this How She Moms community. First, you can email me at whitney at howshemoms.com, or you can go to my contribute page at howshemoms.com and find out what topics I'm currently researching. There will be questionnaires that you can fill out there. You can also follow me on Instagram to see daily tips about how different moms approach the current topic. Finally, you can sign up to receive email questionnaires for each new topic so you can contribute your ideas. Special thanks to my mom for playing my theme music. She's been playing this song since I was a little girl, and to me, it's part of the soundtrack of motherhood. <laughs>